Welcome to Coast Keeper Streams. Today we will be celebrating World Turtle, World Turtle Day. Um, so Coast Keeper's restoration work, um, working to restore eelgrass and oyster beds here in Orange County, all of this work is to protect the habitat of these beautiful species. So today we wanted to highlight them and learn a little bit more about them um, and what more we can do besides restoration and in our own daily lives to help protect them. So we've invited um, some guests that I will let our education coordinator, Christina Robinson, introduce. She's gonna let us know a little bit more about her personal work in this field and then she will introduce our guests today who will be presenting for us. So I just wanted to say hello and a quick thank you for joining our OCCK streams today. We hope you learn a lot. And please, uh, if you have any questions for us, you can use the chat feature or you could always contact us um, after the fact and we'd be more than happy to answer your questions. All right, we'll switch it over to Christina. Hi everybody, so thank you for tuning in on World Sea Turtle Day and to another Orange County Coast Keeper Streams episode. Today we were, we're gonna have um, a very special guest. I volunteer at NOAA in Long Beach. Um, helping with the data for any type of marine mammals or sea turtles that get entangled or harmed. And with this work, when I volunteer with them, I've been able to meet Sabrina, um, the executive director of SoCal Sea Turtles. And it's been my pleasure getting to work beside her, getting to do outreach events at boat shows um, and educate the public about the sea turtles we have here in this region. So without further ado, please welcome Sabrina Mashburn from SoCal Sea Turtles. Morning. I am so happy to be presenting about my favorite topic today, Southern California sea turtles. Am I muted? Oh, excellent. <laughs> Sorry, I just got a notification on my computer that you couldn't hear me. Um, but without further ado, let me share my screen and talk about my favorite animals in the whole world, SoCal sea turtles. So while most people in Southern California know all about our marine mammals and Garibaldi, even though we've always had sea turtles here, many people don't even know they exist. But we actually have a few species that either call our waters home or use our waters as part of their grand trans world um, migration pattern. So our first species is the leatherback sea turtle, Dermochelis coriacea. And this turtle is our California state marine reptile. Um, they are not terribly common down here in Southern California, but you can see them up near San Francisco Bay and also in the state of Washington. They prefer cold water because they like to eat jellyfish. And believe it or not, there are actually more jellyfish in cold waters than in warm waters like we like to think about them. And the leatherback turtle has an amazing migration. Even though they eat jellyfish in Washington, Oregon, and California, they actually nest and breed all the way in Papua New Guinea and Indonesia. And so if you think about it, every time these turtles want to go and lay their eggs, they have to cross the entire Pacific Ocean to get there. Our next species is a more localized species and also Mexico's most common sea turtle the olive ridley, and these guys are famous for what you see in this photograph here, the arabata, which means arrival, and basically thousands of females gather together and then nest all at once, and people think that this is a strategy to help them avoid predators, because if you have thousands and thousands and thousands of eggs being laid all at the same time, it would be impossible for the predators to eat all of them. These sea turtles are not rare, although they are pretty rare in Southern California. They can be found everywhere um, from Southern Mexico all the way up the coast. Offshore, we have these loggerhead sea turtles and they are called loggerheads because they have these big blocky heads. In this photo, you'll see two re sea turtle researchers who actually go out every summer and tag these loggerheads to find out where they're coming from and where they're going. And this was the first Pacific sea turtles journey to be mapped. 
and researchers were shocked to find out just how far these loggerheads travel to breed. Believe it or not, loggerheads from Southern California and Mexico go all the way to the beaches of Japan to lay their eggs, and that's where their hatchlings are born. So these little hatchlings need to go all the way from Japan to Southern California um, to forage and grow before they can go back to Japan to nest. Now my favorite species is our most common species here in Southern California. This photo was actually taken in La Jolla. And this is of course the famous, the one, the only, the green sea turtle. And the green sea turtle is the largest of the hard shell sea turtles weighing in between 300 and 500 pounds. And their shell length is between three and five feet. So these are massive, massive marine reptiles hanging out all around our coastal waters in Southern California. Some general facts about our green sea turtles. This is another local shot here. They are the largest of the hard shelled turtles. They have a comparatively small head and rounded beak. This makes them especially difficult to spot when they bring their heads out of the water to breathe. And they have a lifespan of at least 80 years. A lot of people think that turtles can live forever. But in reality, they live basically as long as we do, more than 80 years, but probably not more than 100. What's different between us and sea turtles, however, is that sea turtles take much, much longer to reach sexual maturity. And for green sea turtles especially, they don't become sexually mature until they're between 20 and 40 years of age, depending on where they live. So they have to survive a long time out in the wild before they are able to return to their natal beaches or the beaches where they were born to lay their eggs. Feeding in green turtles is especially interesting here in Southern California. Adult green turtles in most parts of the world are herbivorous, meaning they eat mostly vegetable sources of food. So sea grasses and algae. This gives them their name, the green turtle because when people used to eat green turtles for food, here you can see in Key West in the 1970s, um, people were eating green turtles in the 1960s. The green turtle did not become an official endangered species until the Endangered Species Act came out in 1973. And so before then it was legal to eat them and they have green fat on their belly, which means turtle soup is probably green as well, and that gives them their name, the green turtle. But hatchlings and young adult turtles are actually omnivorous. So they eat things like jellies and basically anything they can catch, snails, sea slugs, squid, bait from fishermen's hooks. Then you can see this little juvenile green turtle right now eating this little squid here. But in the Eastern Pacific, so in California and Mexico, our green turtles eat 50% vegetable protein and 50% animal protein throughout their lives. And so you'll see here on the slide, we have a picture of one of their favorite foods, eelgrass, Sostra marina, which Coast Keeper is helping to um, bring back to their native habitats and also the San Diego Dorid, which is a nudibranch or a sea slug. And this is also a favorite food of our sea turtles. Now on to one of everybody's favorite topics, green sea turtle nesting. Nesting is one of the most studied moments of a turtle's life because it is one of the few times that they actually come out of the water. Adults aged 25 to 80 years old will actually return to the same beaches where they were born every two to four years to lay eggs. So mating and breeding is not an every year activity for these turtles. Females will nest approximately once every two weeks while they're at the natal beach. And older females tend to nest more frequently. Younger females tend to nest less frequently. Each female will lay an average of five nests or clutches per season. And each clutch can contain between 100 and 300 eggs. So up to 675 baby turtles per female per breeding season. So females produce a lot of turtles. 
And this brings us, of course, to our boffs. And a boff is a pet name for a big old fertile female. And this is a term that you'll see used a lot in fisheries, but is also true for turtles. Larger, older females lay larger clutches, which means they're laying more eggs, and they usually pick more secure places further from the ocean to nest. So this means that while protecting hatchlings is really important, the big old fertile females are the most valuable sea turtles to conserve. And these, of course, are more difficult to conserve than hatchlings because they're spending almost all of their lives at sea. Now onto the cutie pies, the little hatchlings. Eggs incubate for approximately two months. And unfortunately, because they're so small and defenseless, very few hatchlings will survive to reproductive age. And the number of hatchlings that survives is dependent on the amount of traffic that beach has. If there are cars driving up and down the beach, that can kill hatchlings and the number of predators. Some islands don't have predators like dogs and cats and raccoons. And so those islands will have a much higher success rate of hatchlings than places that have dogs, cats, raccoons, and cars crunching them on the beach. Now a spotlight on San Diego and LA's green turtles. You can see a harbor seal here with a green turtle in San Diego on the slide, a very rare but cool sight to see. Southern California has some of the largest green sea turtles on earth. We think that they are so large because the water here is much colder than in other parts of their habitat. And the bigger your body size, the more heat you can conserve. Also, their color is quite different than other green turtles that you might have seen, um, such as in Florida or the Caribbean. Most green turtles have light yellowish carapaces and very light yellowish or white skin, like this green sea turtle from the Atlantic. But interestingly enough, the East Pacific green turtles have darker heart-shaped carapaces and much darker skin, like this green sea turtle here in San Diego and that turtle is alive, it was taken out of the water to be weighed and measured and then returned to the water, just in case anyone was not sure. So our sea turtles have sometimes been called the Pacific black turtle, and they actually are the same subspecies as the sea turtles you see in Hawaii. And this photo is actually a Hawaiian green turtle, and you can see it also has the black skin, the dark carapace, and the little heart-shaped divot at the bottom of the carapace, just like our East Pacific greens. So our next topic is going to be the life cycle of the green turtle from Southern California. And this is something that was just recently discovered in the past 10 years or so from telemetry studies of sea turtles leaving the LA and San Diego area, and actually some of them arriving at their breeding ground. So you can see our sea turtles start here in the Revilla Jijidos Islands in southern Mexico, way far offshore from Baja. And once they meet up with a mate, they will mate and the male will leave. The female will stay to lay her eggs on the islands. And two months later, we get a batch of little hatchlings. And these little hatchlings will work their way up the coast of Mexico all the way to San Diego Bay or Los Angeles and remain for the rest of their lives within this area. Now, how did we get that information? Scientists at NOAA actually have permits to be able to take these green turtles out of the water um, and then put satellite trackers on the top of their shell or carapace that stay on for about three months. So they don't impede the turtle's life or give them a hard time. You know, they don't have trouble swimming with the tag on. And the tag does fall off when the turtles shed their scoop. Just like a snake sheds its skin, the turtles actually shed the scales on the back of their carapace quite frequently. And so in this photograph here, you can see we have a large male turtle. His name is Trey, T-R-E-Y. He's a, he's a surfer dude from Southern California. And you can tell he's a male because he has a great big tail. Females will have a little bitty tail 
about the size of a human thumb, and males will have a tail the size of a forearm. So it's very easy to tell that this turtle is a male. And after he was tagged in 2015, he became the very first turtle to go all the way down to the Revilla Gijidos Islands and back. And so this is his track that he took and every little red dot shows one spot where his, his track, his tag transmitted a signal at the surface. So you can see it's a pretty direct route. And this was the clincher to let us know that even though these two populations were genetically almost identical, we now actually see evidence of turtles traveling between the Revilla Gijidos Islands and Southern California. And there's Trey's little track. So why don't people know about these turtles? We have turtles here. They've always been here. Um, I did a study to find out what was going on with the lack of turtle knowledge in Southern California. And now I'd like to share a few things that I learned from that study with you today. The first question I wanted to ask was, who is seeing sea turtles in Southern California? And I wasn't too surprised to see that commercial fishermen are seeing the most turtles, of course, because they're on the water every day. But what was surprising is that out of all the other commercial boaters, recreational boaters are seeing the second most turtles out of everybody. So you see 43% of turtle sightings were commercial fishermen and 16% were recreational boaters. So that means that recreational boaters really need to learn more about our turtles um, because they're seeing them and that's a valuable source of information for the scientific community. And of course, when asked if they knew turtle sightings could be reported, 70% of the commercial boaters who are seeing these turtles out on the water said they didn't know, and 92% of recreational boaters didn't know they could be reported. So this is a, a ton of information that the scientific community is missing out on because people don't know that they can report turtles. And so part of why I do these presentations is to make sure that every boater on the water knows that you can report your turtle sightings and that these reports are so important to um, learning more about these turtles. Next, I wanted to talk about the threats to SoCal sea turtles because they're a little bit different here in Southern California than on their nesting beaches in tropical countries, for instance. So most people know that plastic trash is a big problem for sea turtles. And of course, oil and chemicals in the water, fishing gear, and boats and human swimmers ranked out as the least, the least threatening things to sea turtles. When I talked to recreational boaters, they said basically the same thing. They thought fishing gear and plastic pollution were the biggest threats to sea turtles. However, big reveal, in Southern California, boat collisions are the number one killer of sea turtles. And most people have no idea that this is happening. Um, because it's very difficult to find a turtle that's been hit, after the fact, especially if a boat's going quickly, we believe that these numbers are underreported. But between 2010 and 2016, we had 13 turtles that came up dead with evidence of boat strike, um, and only two that died after interactions with fisheries, such as getting caught in nets or eating um, fisheries debris. And no turtles died after being sucked into the intake of power plants, from disease or cold stunning. So boat strike is really something that we need to focus on here in Southern California. And a lot of people ask, you know, why is getting hit by a boat so much more deadly to a turtle than potentially swallowing a hook or getting tangled up in a fishing net? And the reason is that boat propellers slice through a sea turtle's carapace, which damages their lungs and other internal organs on, on impact. And so there really is no way to rehab a turtle that has been sliced by a propeller, unlike uh, manatee or some other marine mammals that can recover from these kinds of strikes. So how can you help sea turtles um, in Southern California? Number one, you can obey speed limits 
and look for surfacing turtles near shore, especially at sunset. Our sea turtles like to be out in the open ocean, but they also like to come into bays and estuaries and take refuge, similar to what we do with our boats at night, um, take refuge from predators and from high seas by being close to shore, especially if there are plants growing out of the water and nice things for them to eat. And so really be cognizant of sea turtles near shore. Number two, you can report your sea turtle sightings at SoCalSeaTurtles.org. And this will go straight to the scientists at NOAA and allow them to make management decisions based on how many turtles are being reported in different areas at different times. Plastic is also a huge problem for turtles, although it's not as big of a problem for our turtles as it is for turtles in some places around the world it still is a killer. Um, as you can see, this plastic bag looks very much like a jellyfish hanging at the surface, and this poor turtle is about to eat it. So if you see non-biodegradable trash anywhere near the water, even if you didn't leave it there, please pick it up and put it in covered trash receptacles. Also, tell fellow boaters, family, and friends about how they can help save our turtles. Word of mouth is a great tool in educating a community and our community needs to be educated about our turtles and how to save them. So please take what you learned today and share it with those that you know that might be on the water. And finally, support our sea turtle speed sign initiative. We are trying to get these sea turtle speed signs put up all, all along the waterfront, especially in places where sea turtles frequent. So if you'd like to host a sign, please get in touch with me um, or the folks at Coastkeeper and we can get a free sign to your property and put it up so that people who are on the water know that there are sea turtles in shallow water in Southern California and that we can help save them by slowing our boats down. With that, I want to conclude and say thank you so much to everyone for listening. And thank you, of course, to our sponsors, NOAA, Scripps, the Edna Bailey Sussman Fund, the Navy, and Ralph Pace Photography for the beautiful photos. And if anyone has questions, I'm happy to stay as long as you like and answer any questions you may have. Feel free to contact us again after the fact via email, and we can always forward any questions that we can't answer over to Sabrina as well. Um, also getting in contact about the sign. So thank you everyone for joining us on our stream today. I think we are at time. Um, yeah, and no, I don't see any questions coming in. So again, if you have questions, email us. Thank you all for joining and we hope you learned a lot and have a great day.